At this time, we are going to turn our attention to the Word of God, to the book of Nehemiah. And uh, we're starting a new series today entitled, Nehemiah. Whoa, that is super creative, Pastor Dave. Me and Justin were joking about this last week. Uh, but you know, the simplicity of God's Word is all we need. And so uh, sometimes the best thing to do is just be straightforward and uh, not try to get cute with anything and just preach what's in the Word of God, even so much so as the title, Nehemiah. Ironically, Nehemiah uh, is actually uh, a part of Ezra. At one time, scholars believe they were one book. And, um, and so you'll hear me reference Ezra from time to time. But, uh, but Nehemiah is about many things. Uh, you'll hear the undertone of what it's mainly about as we continue on week by week. Uh, but, but one of the things it's about, probably not the main thing, but one of the things it's about is about rebuilding. And I'd like to ask you a question this morning. How many of you have ever needed to rebuild at some point in your life? And I don't mean just a building, but you needed to start over. We all need that at times to have a fresh start, a restart, a rebuild. Sometimes we encounter unexpected circumstances, situations, and even tragedy in life, and we need to begin again. Nehemiah shows us how. Nehemiah chapter 1, if you're with me, say amen. Amen. Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 1, the words of Nehemiah, the son of Hekeliah. Now it happened in the month of Chislev, in the 20th year, while I was in Susa, the capital, that Hanani, one of my brothers, and some men from Judah came. And I asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped and had survived the captivity and about Jerusalem. Verse 3, they said to me, the remnant there in the province who survived the captivity are in great distress and reproach. And the wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates are burned with fire. Now it came about when I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days. And I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. I said, I beseech you, O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God who preserves the covenant and loving kindness for those who love him and keep his commandments. Let your ear now be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant, which I am praying before you now, day and night, on behalf of the sons of Israel, your servants, confessing the sins of the sons of Israel, which we have sinned against you. I and my father's house have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, nor the statutes, nor the ordinances, which you have commanded your servant Moses. Remember your word which you commanded your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though those of you who have been scattered were in the most remote part of the heavens, I will gather them from there and will bring them to the place where I have chosen to cause my name to dwell. Verse 10, They are your servants and your people, whom you redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. O Lord, I beseech you, May your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and the prayer of your servants who delight to revere your name and make your servant successful today and grant him compassion before this man. Now I was the cupbearer to the king. Let's pray. Father, we ask that you would speak through your word. And I pray that you would just help me to illuminate as best as I can with my words and my my tongue and my actions and everything within me, Lord, what you want to say. May your spirit flow through me. May he speak the words that you want him to speak. And God, I pray that you would just open hearts to be receptive to what you have to say. It's in Christ's name we pray these things. Amen. Now there's a few things we need to know this morning. And tonight or today I'm going to just focus on kind of laying a foundation. Okay? Because Nehemiah is, as best as I can describe, a strange book. And, and we're going to see a large, bigger picture at the very end, not of this sermon, but of this sermon series. And, and so we're driving somewhere, but I want you to understand that Nehemiah starts out and Ezra starts out with hope. Hope of the promises of God, of what he will do if the children of Israel will obey him. And what he will do regardless of what the children of Israel will do. But as it relates to your life and to my life, I want to take a bit of a different approach this morning. And I want to give you two things 
or I'm sorry, three things that you and I need to know in order to rebuild. If you're young in here, if you're under the age of 20 or 21, chances are that you are going to need to, need to rebuild at some point in your life. A tragedy is going to take place. Uh, the adults in here can tell you probably 100% of them, that life has not panned out exactly as they had planned. And so you will need to often rebuild your life. And so we're going to see how to do that through the book of Nehemiah. Here are the things that you and I need to know in order to rebuild. Number one, God is in control of the big things. As a believer and follower of Jesus Christ, you need to store this away in your mind, in your heart, that God is in control of the big things. Look at verses 1 through 2. He says, The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hekeliah. Now it happened in the month of Chislev, in the 20th year, while I was in Susa, the capital, that Hanani, one of my brothers, and some men from Judah came, and I asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped and had survived what? The captivity and about Jerusalem. What is he talking about? Verse 3 gives us some more information. They said to me, the remnant there is in the province who survived the captivity are in great distress and reproach. And the wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates are burned with fire. Now if you know what's going on, you understand here that God often would use foreign empires, foreign enemies of Israel to chastise Israel. He would bring in other armies of other countries, of other nations to bring in chastisement, rebuke against the nation of Israel for the nation of Israel rebelling against the one true God. He did this in 722 B.C. with what people group? Anybody know? The Assyrians. The Assyrians came in and basically wiped out many of the Jews, displaced the Jews, and, and just conquered uh, that land, scattered them all over the known world. And then God did something else in about 586, 605 to 586 B.C. How many of you love history? Raise your hand. Okay, the rest of y'all just hang on, okay? <laughs> These are important. Dates are important, even if we don't like them all the time. 586 B.C., the Babylonian sack destroyed and nearly depopulated Jerusalem and the southern kingdom of Judah. And in 538 B.C., the Persians conquered the Babylonians, and the king of Persia, King Cyrus, makes a decree. He decrees that all the Jews that have been held captive are now free to return to their homeland. From this point, over about 90, a 90-year 90 period, there are uh, three major returns. The first return under Zerubbabel, how many of you remember that name? Zerubbabel. Well, it's just a fun name to say, right? At some point, you start to get a little weird with it. Zerubbabel, he leads about 50,000 Jewish people back to the homeland. They begin to rebuild the temple. Okay, So they begin to restore the temple of, of Jerusalem and, and live there once again and inhabit the land and make it their home. The book of Ezra recounts the second return in 458 B.C., led by Ezra, and here... In Nehemiah, we see the beginning of the third return from exile in Babylon of the nation of Israel to their homeland. Everybody got the context? I know it's a little bit confusing at times, but you need to understand uh, that so that you can have a better understand of the idea that God is completely in control of the big things. Think about what he just did. Now, I just read that. And I just gave you a summarization of the historical context of what has happened here. And think about what God did in order to correct and rebuke and chastise and hopefully bring back his people to him. He used two worldwide empires. Three, ultimately. He used people of four nations. Big, big-minded things. Big scheme things that, that most of the people didn't have anything to do with. He used those things to correct his own people. Three foreign empires to do what? To change the heart of the people he loved. Now you and I sitting here this morning can learn something incredibly significant from that. You see, God in his graciousness will use big things to change his people's hearts. And more specifically, God will use big things to change, listen, your heart. 
You might think the things of this world, the things on a global perspective, the things on a national perspective, the uh, things that are beyond your control don't have anything to do with you and you just live in your little bubble and you do your little thing and you would be wrong. God is so in control of the big things that he can use those big things to influence his people and even you this morning. Now the people of Israel were God's chosen people and now we have all been grafted into that people by way of Jesus Christ. Amen? And so God uses the big things in this world to do what he wants to do, to do his will and to ultimately change his people's hearts. We see this in Proverbs 21, 1. Actually, let me back up for a moment. Jeremiah chapter 25, verse 11. This gives you a little bit more context. Jeremiah 25, 11. This is a prophecy about what would be happening with the nation of Israel. They're in rebellion, in rebellion, in rebellion. How many of you are in rebellion right now? Raise your hand. Almost caught one of you. <laughs> They're in rebellion, right? God has warned them time and time again. Stop sinning. Stop following after foreign gods. Stop playing the harlot, right? And in Jeremiah 25, 11, it says this. This whole land, he's speaking of the nation of Israel, the land, the promised land, will be a desolation and a horror. And these nations, the surrounding nations, will serve the king of Babylon. I'm sorry, the, these nations, specifically Israel, will serve the king of Babylon. How many years? That happened. That prophecy has come to pass. God used large nations to correct them. In Jeremiah 29, verse 10. Anybody know Jeremiah 29, 11? I know you do. It's on all types of Christian type stuff. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Right? Plans to give you hope in the future. But do you know verse 10? Let's look at verse 10. For thus says the Lord. Remember, he's speaking to the nation of Israel, the children of Israel. When 70 years have been completed for Babylon, he's saying, when you, you're done with your captivity... Okay, this is something that's upcoming. I will visit you and fulfill my good work to you to bring you back to this place. He says, I'm going to kick you out of the land, and then in 70 years, I'm going to bring you back. Does that sound, sound like a fun experience? But then we go to Jeremiah 29, 11, and he says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Do you see how so many of us have ripped that out of context? God is promising a very unpleasant time for them. Because of their sin, he's saying, it's about to get rough. Somebody's going to come and attack you and win and displace you and take you into captivity. But here's my promise, Israel. I'm going to bring you back into the land after 70 years. And he does that. He brings them back. And it comes in waves. But the first remnant comes back. Around 50,000 people come back and they begin to rebuild the temple. And he fulfills his promise Proving that he is in control of the big things. Proverbs 21.1 says this. The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord like the rivers of water. He turns it wherever he wishes. What a great visual. What a great verse. I love this verse. Just, I can just picture it. It's like someone pouring water into your hands. And you just kind of move it as you want. You want it to go to the right. It goes to the right. You want it to move it to the left. It goes to the left. And he says that's, that's like the, the, the heart of the king. The heart of our president is in the hand of the Lord. And God turns it every which way he wishes. You see, God is in control of the big things. Some of you need to get a grasp on that. Because you're so worried. And you're so fearful. This doesn't mean we don't do anything. We do our part. But we understand that God is in control of the big things. Ezra 1, 1 through 3. I want you to turn there real quick. Just go back a book. If you don't know where it is, it's right before Nehemiah. Ezra chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. I'll give you a moment to get there. Remember, I said Ezra and Nehemiah are thought to be one book. And this is the beginning of the uh, return um, under Cyrus, king of Persia. We'll see that as we read it. Look at verse 1 now. In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, the Persians eventually took world power, okay? They didn't have to destroy ba they didn't have to destroy Jerusalem. It was already destroyed by the uh, Syrians and Babylonians. And so it's destroyed and then all of a sudden on the scene comes the Persians, right? So this is real easy to remember. I'm going to help you history lesson. You're going to be smarter after this. Are you ready? Say amen. Who is the first group of people? The Assyrians. A. Who is the second group of people? The Babylonians. B. Who is the third group of people? 
the Persians, P. It's almost A, B, C. It's A, B, P, all right? Not A, D, T. A, B, P, all right? A, the Assyrians, and then who? The Babylonians, and then the Persians, okay? And where we're going to be in Nehemiah for the whole time is under the Persian Empire. The Persian Empire still has control of all the surrounding area, including Jerusalem and Judah and the children of Israel. So verse 1, now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah, listen to this, the Lord, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he sent a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and also put it in writing saying, thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord the God of heaven has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has appointed me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Whoever there is among you of all his people, he's speaking to the Jewish people, may his God be with him. Let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and rebuild the house of the Lord, the God of Israel. He is the God who is in Jerusalem. That's amazing. Now, you and I read that, and we're like, okay, oh, okay that's, that's cool. You understand what just happened? The ruler of the world at this time comes out and, and clearly admits the God, the real God, the God of the Jews, has, has instructed me, has given me this idea of letting them go back and rebuild your temple. You see, that's an only God thing. Amen? That's an only God type thing. Only God can do that in this instance, you see, God is in control of the big things. This should give you some peace right here, right now. There is an epidemic in our world about 12 years. You know where I'm going with this. 12 years, the world's going to be over. If we don't do something in the next 12 years about the environment and about what's happening with the environment and about our ecosystem and about our pollution into that, 12 years, that's all we got left. Listen, listen. God is in control of the big things. And if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, I don't care if you're five or 100, you need to rest in the confidence that God has said, that's not how the world's going to end. Wake up. Stop buying into all this hoopla and propaganda, okay? It doesn't mean we are to be ignorant and not take care of the, the resources that God has given to us. We should be, of all people, listen, of all people, Christians should be the most environmentally concerned. There should have been an amen there. <laughs> not in terms of idolizing it, but God in the Garden of Eden, gave them rule over the land to take care of it. To take what? Care of it. So we don't mock people, but at the same time, we, we realize that we don't have to be concerned about that like they are. We don't lose our minds. We don't lose sleep. We don't freak out. We don't change world systems because we think the world is going to end in 12 years. That's not what the Word of God says. God is in control of the big things. Secondly, God is in control of the little things. Sometimes we go the opposite route, don't we? Well, 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 I know God's in control of the big things, but he doesn't care about the tiny little minutia of my life. Look at verses 1 and 2. He says, the words of Nehemiah. Now it happened in the month of Chislev in the 20th year while I was in Susa, the capital, that Han and I, one of my brothers and some men from Judah came and I Asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped and had survived the captivity and about Jerusalem. I love this phrase. I don't know if it stood out to you, but in studying it stood out to me. Three words. Now it happened. You see, this is basically the diary of Nehemiah. Okay, Written by Ezra. Ezra had the documents. He knew what Nehemiah had written. And so he's simply writing what Nehemiah had wrote in his we won't call it a diary, we'll call it a journal because he was a guy, all right? But he says, now it happened. It's basically like you and I saying, okay, so this is what happened next. Almost as if it's not that big of a deal in his own mind and heart. But when you look at the grand scheme of all of this, you see how big of a deal it was. You see, in the moment, it rarely feels like God is working in the little things of our lives. Do you know that? 
You can testify to that, can't you? The day-to-day, the mundane, the hour-by-hour, it, not all, it doesn't always feel like God is working. When we're waiting, it doesn't always feel like God is working in the little parts of our lives. He says in the month of Chislev, that's around November. He says in the 20th year. The 20th year of what? The 20th year of the Persian king, Artaxerxes. He says, while I was in Susa, the capital. So he's giving a lot of details. This has all been corroborated by uh, modern science and archaeology. They have found some interesting Egyptian documents that uh, talk about some of the people in this text. So it's all been verified as real historical accounts. He says, while I was in Susa, the capital, wherever the king went, you see, that's where Nehemiah went. Why? Because Nehemiah just so happened to be the cupbearer of the Persian king. He just so happened to be the cupbearer of the Persian king. What was the cupbearer? Many of you probably know, right? They, they tested the wine before it was given to the king to make sure the wine wasn't poisoned. So if that guy croaked, they know, don't give that wine to that king. <laughs> don't do that. And he had been doing that for about 20 years, right? That's one of his jobs, but he was also a close confidant and counselor to the king. That position wasn't just about tasting the wine. It was a trusted position. You see, all these little things added up. All these little things added up. And perhaps he took one step here and one step there, and God led him here, and God led Nehemiah there. And before you know it, he's cupbearer to the king. You see, little things in your life... God has control of those things. You say, oh, I mean, I I ran out of gas. That was a complete accident. Well, God will use it. Well, I ran into this person, and I didn't expect to, and it really took up too much time. That's appointed by God. You see, don't miscount the little things in your life. God has a purpose for them. 20 years God had preserved his life. As the king's cupbearer. Think about that job for a moment. <laughs> That's a scary job, right? How many of you want that job? Now, how many of you want that job if it pays $500,000? Oh, some of you, it starts to change a little bit. We want to raise the price a little bit, right? That's a, a little thing. Your job is a little thing that's a big thing. God has placed you. Some of you are so unhappy where you're at. God has placed you right where you are. And it's a little thing to you, but it's a big thing in the kingdom of God. Just like he is in control here in terms of Nehemiah and placing him exactly where he wants him to be, God is in charge of where you are. And he has you exactly where he wants you to be. He's the cupbearer to the king. You ever think about how did that happen? Now, I don't know for sure, but did you know, I know this for sure, that Esther was his mother-in-law. He had some connections. Little connections that probably maybe got him that job. Or at least she whispered in the king's ear, hey, why why don't you look at this guy? He's pretty smart. He's pretty articulate. He's he's a wise man. He's a person that knows God. Little things add up. We don't serve a small God. There are no little happenings with our God. Matthew 10, 29, listen to what Jesus says. He says, are not two sparrows sold for a copper coin? Basically, it's the amount of a cent. Are not two sparrow coins sold for a penny? And not one of them, listen, not one of them falls to the ground apart from your father's will. See, God is in control of a sparrow falling and dying. A sparrow, a bird, a tiny bird falling to the ground. God is in control of that. Don't ever think that God is not in control of the little things of your life. He is in complete control. You serve a God who knows exactly where you are and exactly who's around you, and he knows exactly what he's doing. God is in control of the little things. If you're with me, say amen. Amen. So not only is God in control of the big things, God is in control of the little things, but let's get a little bit more detailed this morning. God is in control of the timely things. Remember I said that phrase, now it happened. And then he goes into detail about time. In the month of Chislev, in the 20th year, while I was in Susa, the capital. When was the last time you had a visitor 
unexpectedly come in and maybe a relative or a friend just show up at your house. Anybody in the last week that happened to? Oh, okay. Anybody in the last month? Last couple months, six months? Why? Why, why, why is it so much more rare now? <laughs> just text me. Let me know you're coming, right? We have so much communication now that we forget that in this time, not so much. Right? It took them forever to communicate with one another. It took them forever to travel from one destination to another. And we forget that. We read in verse 2 where it says that Hananiah, one of my brothers, and some men from Judah came, and I asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped and had survived the captivity and about Jerusalem. We say, cool. My school's brother dropped in and said hello, right? <laughs> But we'd be wise to remember no phone, no email, no Instagram, listen, no telegram, not even our version of snail mail, right? Now, they had mail, they had communications, they had people who would go and they would send things, but it took forever. It took a long, long time. And Nehemiah here is in Susa, and his brother comes from Jerusalem Anybody know how far that distance is, that trek is? Today, it's around 1,000 miles. Back then, it was more like 1,300, 1,400, maybe 1,500 miles. That's a long journey, right? So you're like, cool, he probably just jumped on the plane, right? He got in a car. He rode a scooter. <laughs> what did he do? Camels, probably, right? Camels, at best, travel about 40 miles per day. With all the stuff they would be carrying, 40 miles per day, how much ground does that cover in a day? Let's say 1,600 miles. It's about, what, 40 miles a day, 1,600 miles? Come on, mathematicians, what do you got? That's a, that's, that's a, that's a bit of a distance, 40 miles a day, 1,600 miles. 40 days it takes. 40 days to get from one point to the other. That is a long time to travel. Can somebody give me an amen? Amen. How many of you like to travel? Not, not many people love to make long, I mean, do you like traveling that much? <laughs> a 40-day trip, right, from one point to the other on camelback. You say, Dave, what is the point? What are you getting at? Well, God's timing is perfect. You see, the capital here, Susa, was the king's winter residence. He wasn't always there. And we said, we already said, wherever the king went, that's where Nehemiah went, right? And so there's a chance that they could travel 40 days and all of a sudden, uh-oh. Oh, yeah, he had to make an emergency exit. He's with the king. He's not here. Lucky timing, right? No. Our God is a God of perfect timing. Second Peter 3.8. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. Now, that's not, listen, now that's not saying that, you know, like some people believe that creation was created in one day, and really it was a thousand days. No, it's just saying that time, listen, 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 time is irrelevant to God. <laughs> time is a, is a construct that we have, that God has allowed us to have, that is a good thing, but listen, our God, your God, if you're a follower of Christ, is outside of time. Someone might need to hear this this morning. God is never late. He is never early. He can't be rushed. And he doesn't owe you an explanation for his timing. God is outside of time. Thus, he is not restricted to it. Stop worrying, stop fretting, stop arguing, and start trusting in the God who is in control of all time. This is something I needed to hear this week. And I assume many of you need to hear it right now. There have been many, many times in my life where something has happened at the exact right moment. And it's only as a believer and follower of Jesus Christ that I could say, wow. My God is a God of all time. Whatever you're waiting for, whatever you're doing, whatever you think has passed you, listen, trust in the timeliness of your God. 
Ultimately, here's what we see in all of Nehemiah. Remind you, I'm setting a base for this whole entire series. It's this. Number four, God is in control of all things. It's that simple. You see, sometimes we just need to be reminded about the basics of the faith. And one of the basics of the faith is the sovereignty of God. That he is in control of all things. You say, Dave, does that mean I don't have a free will? No, I mean that God will accomplish his purposes and plans. And he gives you and I the opportunity to be a part of it. But we can oppose it. But even in opposing it, God will use that for his plan. It's amazing. Here, I want you to write this in your notes. It's the verse, Isaiah 46, verses 9 through 11. You're not going to write the whole verse. Just write the reference because I want you to go back sometime and read this later this week. We're going to read it right now. Isaiah 46, 9 through 11. You see, we have to understand that we serve the same God as Nehemiah. What do you all say with me? The same God. Say it with me. The same God. It is the same God. He is the same sovereign God and he is in complete control. Big things, little things, timely things, all things, God is in control. Isaiah 46, 9 through 11. Remember the former things. These, he's speaking to the rebellious people. Remember the former things long past. For I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is no one like me. Listen to what he says in verse 10. He gets specific. Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things which have not been done this is what he says my purpose will be established and i will accomplish all my good pleasure calling a bird of prey listen to this here's the little things calling a bird of prey from the east here's a big thing and the man and the man of my purpose from a far country truly i have spoken truly i will bring it to pass i have planned it surely i will do it. Now listen, listen. Some of you are on the wrong side of the sovereignty of God. You're so worried about culture and what your friends say and what culture says and society says and all these other things and you think you're doing something good but you're actually on the wrong side of God's sovereign plan. Now listen to this. It doesn't matter. The only thing that matters, the only person it matters to is you. You're the one that's going to miss out. You're the one that's going to miss out on the perfect plan of God. I want you to write this in your notes. It's a sentence that I didn't put in there. And I wish I had. But I want you to write it. I think it will last longer in your mind. Above all, Nehemiah is about the good hand of God in all things. I struggled with this book. And I'm still struggling with this book. And, and God revealed something to me last night that was revelatory and, and just astounding in terms of the grandiose plan that he has even through Ezra and Nehemiah and how he used Zerubbabel and how he used Ezra and how he used Nehemiah and, and, and just when we get to the end it, it's going to leave you kind of like that was anticlimactic. It's going to leave you hanging a little bit. But you need to understand, and we need to understand this morning, that the sovereignty of God rules over all things. Above all, here's the phrase again, above all, Nehemiah is about the good hand of God in all things. You see, it's tempting to look at Nehemiah and say, man, this book is about his leadership. And it is to an extent. But above all, the book of Nehemiah is about the good hand of God. Would you say that with me? The good hand of God in all things. And at the same time, Nehemiah is about your decision to align yourself and your life with him or in opposition to him. I, I, need, um, I need a volunteer. Younger, perhaps, is, is, would be the best. I need somebody smaller than Brogan. Give me a kid. Come on. One of y'all kids. Come on. Don't be scared. One of, you, one of you guys. One of you two. Come on. Anybody? Nikki, come on. Come on. I tried. I tried. <clears throat> right, I want you to stand right here and just face that way. Okay. Oh, okay. Oh, you want to help me? Okay, see you later. <laughs> okay, stand right here. I want you to face that, that wall right there, okay? Now, now, take your hands out and just put them right there. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you to do something. You have a free choice. You don't have to if you don't want to. But here's what's going on. I got a plan. I'm going to walk from here to that wall. 
and I'd like you to come with me. But you got to hold my hand. Okay? My hand's cold, isn't it? It's pretty freezing. We're almost there. Are you nervous? Don't worry. This is all for a purpose. Okay. Now go that way and go back to your mom. Now, Brooklyn had a choice to make. I had a plan. Simple plan. Walk to that wall. I knew what I was going to do. I was going to let her go back to her seat. Very simple plan. And I asked her to take my hand and let me lead her. She had an option. Take the hand and follow in my plan. Or she could have rejected and backed away and maybe even gone walked over this way. Now listen, this is very important. No matter what she did, my plan was accomplished. This, my plan was to give you an illustration of the sovereignty of God in all things. To show you that you have a choice, but God's plan will be accomplished. If she had done something else, guess what? It still would have met my illustration. It still would have been God's will and God's plan. It would have been exactly what God wanted. And in your life, you have a choice. God is not going to make you robotically do things. He's not going to say, okay, now I'm going to make this foot go in that front and that and that. that. He's not going to do that to you. He gives you a free will. It's his permissive will. But listen, God wants you in his perfect will. And that means taking his hand and following him, whatever it costs, whatever it takes, making him first in your life, just like Nehemiah did. God will accomplish his purpose with us or without us. We can either surrender to the good hand of God or we can fight against it. He graciously gives you and I the opportunity to participate in his perfect plan. I want to give you three application steps this morning. Very basic, very simple. Number one, first thing that we need to do is stand in awe. I encourage you and I challenge you to read the entire book of Nehemiah this week. It's not difficult. It's only 13 chapters. It's not very long. It'll take you about an hour at the very most. You can break it up. Read through Nehemiah and then take some time to stand in awe of the sovereignty of God. It's amazing, and we're going to pull some of this out, but you'll get so much more out of this sermon series if you go through Nehemiah and you look for the good hand of God in all things. Stand in awe of the power and the greatness of our God. Think about what he did just in today's lesson. We, we haven't even scratched the surface. He used the Assyrians. He uses the Babylonians. He uses the world empires to orchestrate his perfect plan. What an amazing and powerful God we serve. Amen? Amen? Secondly, walk in seriousness. Now, this might sound a little odd, but our culture just wants to have fun. Right? That, that's what we see in our culture. You see it in TV shows and movies and advertisements. And what everyone is pushing is just do whatever gives you the most pleasure. Do whatever gives you the most fun. Life is just to be enjoyed. Listen, that is true to an extent. You should enjoy life. But I think as a church and as, as a people group of God, we have lost the understanding of the seriousness of the things of God. That it's not just something we add to our life. It's not just something we do when it's convenient. Think about Nehemiah. He ends up leaving everything. What a position he has. The money he has, the clout he has, the comfort he has, the pleasure he has. And he says, listen, here's a need, here's God's plan, and I'm going to be a part of it if God is willing to have me. And he's serious about it. And in your life, I want to challenge you to walk in seriousness. It doesn't mean you have to be a prude, a stick in the mud. <laughs> Christians get that reputation, but in terms of what you do in this life and what you will do in your job and your work and your relationships and everything that you do, having an understanding of God's in control. And it doesn't make us say, oh, well, then I'll just do whatever I want. No, if we really understand the sovereignty of God, that the good hand of God is over all things, then that what it should make you want to do is be a part of that. God, I want to be a part of that. I want to be perfectly in line. I want to grab your hand and I want to say, lead me. Show me what to do in my life. See, we need to stand in awe, but we also need to walk in seriousness. If God has a plan, then I want to be intentional about being a part of his plan. Lastly, is to rest in surrender. You see, the believer who knows 
that his or her God is sovereign, are you ready for this? Say amen. Should have peace. If you don't, you're forgetting the sovereignty of God. You should have peace. A peace and a confidence, listen, and a calmness that others are mystified by. You're not concerned about our nation. You're not concerned about what's happening in Syria. You're not concerned. Of course we're concerned, but we don't lose our minds over it. Because we have a God who is in complete control. That will bring you rest. Even to the point when you walk into a restaurant and you fear, well, what if a terrorist comes in here? Movie theater. Stadium. Church. Many people have come to me and said, well, what are we going to do if a terrorist comes? Listen, we have a plan in place. We have some people here that we, we, we put in place, but ultimately we say, what do you mean, what are we going to do? Well, we rest in the sovereignty of a good and gracious God and his hand upon us. Stand in awe, walk in seriousness, rest in surrender. When we do that, the world sees that we truly are people of a sovereign God.